All right, I'm very happy to be uh, contributing to this uh, tribute to uh, Sir Harshad Kumar Dharamshi Hansraj Badija on this occasion of his uh, retirement. Uh, my presentation will be from the perspective of my latest day job at my alma mater, as well as the uh, 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 commercial applications of materials design uh, by our company, Questec, <clears throat> and their ongoing collaborations under the uh, multi-institutional CHIMED uh, Design uh, Center. Uh, I first came to know a young Sir Harry in the uh, 1970s when uh, MIT hosted uh, the uh, ICOMET International Martinsite uh, Conference. That's where we first met. Uh, and that led uh, to Harry spending some time as a visiting scholar uh, at MIT uh, to collaborate uh, on the science of uh, phase transformations. Uh, and that very early collaboration uh, led to a, a model. Let me see if I can get this to go. Hmm. Just want to advance. There we go. All right. Can you see my next slide? Yes, we see it. Yes. So we, we looked at uh, an approach uh, to Bainitic transformations, uh, building on uh, the, the framework that we had established for uh, barrierless heterogeneous martensitic nucleation paced by interfacial mobility. And uh, with that model in place, we asked the question, uh, if we take the same nucleating defects and, and embryos of martensite uh, that are stabilized by their defect interaction uh, and consider at a temperature above MS, uh, would it be possible for a small amount of non-equilibrium partitioning across the interface to increase the driving force enough to uh, assist the glide of that interface? So this led uh, to a, a quantitative exploration of the concept of coupled diffusional displacive uh, transformation. So we started out with the two velocity uh, equations uh, for uh, the interfacial glide and the diffusional transport uh, across the interface or, or uh, uh, the volume transport away from the interface. And then ultimately uh, added a third velocity equation in our second paper, uh, adding a trapping law uh, for the transport across the interface. And this then uh, predicted a, uh, at a given transformation temperature above MS, uh, there was a unique solution uh, for the interfacial velocity at nucleation that, that paced the nucleation rate uh, and a, uh, a prescribed amount of partitioning uh, of the uh, uh, carbon that would allow that uh, interfacial motion. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> looking at the difference in the magnitude of capillary energy at the nucleation stage versus the growth stage, uh, as the particle grew in size, uh, it would need less partitioning. Uh, and in the case of lower bainite, it led to the prediction that while the nucleation would be assisted by partial uh, uh, partitioning, that the growth could be uh, partitionless, uh, as had been uh, proposed by uh, Harry's uh, earlier models. Uh, I uh, came to understand that uh, in later years, uh, Jack Christian seemed to talk Harry out of this approach, but uh, uh, we stuck with it at, at Questech and coded it up, and we made very good use of this uh, framework as an extension of our Martensite framework uh, to con control the hardenability in our designs of, of Martensitic steels. But uh, notably, we also had one example of a commercial contract where a client uh, asked us to run it for a matrix of alloy compositions and they used the output of our simulations uh, to calibrate uh, the uh, descriptive JMAC models uh, in commercial heat treating uh, software. So it was a early example of uh, generating data from fundamental simulation uh, as an alternative uh, to experimental uh, dilatometry. Uh, so that's the story of our, of our Bainite uh, collaboration uh, in the science of phase transformations. But uh, I think really our uh, early collaboration, uh, a far more impactful result 
was our early exploration that led to a, a common vision uh, of the potential of a new form of science-based materials engineering that would be enabled by the predictive power uh, of CALFAD fundamental data. Uh, and uh, we both have followed that over the ensuing decades. Uh, it was a rocky road along the way, but it really has happened and it really has transformed the materials profession. Uh, I think Harry and our, uh, I are at the stage of life now where we can kick back uh, and be thoroughly amused by uh, the achievements uh, of our students uh, who have really uh, transformed our dreams uh, into a reality. And in uh, Harry's case, uh, three particular students uh, I'd like to describe uh, for which I've had uh, very fruitful uh, interactions uh, over the years are, are the three shown here. Uh, the most uh, senior one being uh, Hiroshi Harada of NIMS uh, in Japan, uh, who set out uh, in focusing his career uh, on the computational design of high performance super alloys, particularly single crystal uh, turbine blade uh, alloys. And his early achievements in this uh, uh, attracted the attention of Rolls Royce. Uh, and this ultimately led uh, to a Japanese funded program uh, that Harry had at uh, Cambridge in collaboration with Rolls. I think it was called the Atomic Arrangement Design and Control uh, Program. Uh, and during a sabbatical at Cambridge in 92, I got to participate in it. And it was really a very exciting time, uh, all the things that, that were going on. Uh, ultimately, uh, as Hiroshi uh, refined the accuracy uh, of his models, he ultimately delivered, I believe, what was the TMS-129 uh, single crystal turbine blade alloy that was adopted uh, by Rolls-Royce. And I think that's a very uh, significant historic milestone uh, in the evolution of computational materials design. Now in my own work in design, I, I focused on Martin Siddick steels. Uh, Harry was uh, strongly influenced uh, by earlier experience uh, in welding uh, technology, particularly uh, the complex phenomena in multi-pass uh, welding. Uh, and this, the complexity of it motored motivated him to do really pioneering work in what we now call machine learning through the adaptation of neural network uh, uh, techniques uh, to get control of the complex phenomena uh, in welding. Uh, the, uh, that line of uh, welding research uh, was carried on by uh, Suresh Babu, now at uh, University of uh, Tennessee, uh, Knoxville. Uh, and I've been able to uh, uh, collaborate uh, with him uh, often. Uh, uh, whenever I have an issue with weldability, uh, it's uh, Babu that I call up. Uh, and he's also had a role uh, in uh, advising some of the students in, in, in my design teams, uh, teams related to uh, weldability phenomena. So I really greatly valued uh, having a, a local expert from the Badija uh, school. Now, Harry's approach, uh, he felt very strongly that particularly uh, the results of uh, uh, public funded research uh, should be openly uh, disclosed uh, and throughout his career has uh, put not only his research results, but his codes uh, out uh, in his, particularly in his, uh, the materials algorithm uh, project that he started very uh, early on. And we've uh, greatly benefited by having access out uh, of the tools that, that he put out there. Uh, but uh, his later student, Roger Reed, uh, is, is an exception to that approach. Uh, with his move to Oxford, he founded what is now the company Alloyd. Uh, and I think it's a very, also a very important milestone uh, in the ongoing commercialization uh, of this new technology, which is greatly uh, increasing its impact. So these are guys who I really uh, enjoyed uh, collaborating with uh, over the decades. Um, coming back over to my side of the pond, uh, the context of our work now uh, it is this National Materials Genome Initiative uh, announced by President Obama a, a decade ago uh, with the overarching uh, engineering goal of taking what has historically been a 10 to 20 year materials development cycle and compressing that uh, by at least 50%. 
uh, using fundamental databases uh, and tools that, that uh, we demonstrated over the years. The, uh, the one student uh, of mine that I would like to brag about is Charlie Chuman. Uh, Charlie uh, was the uh, first doctoral student when I made my move to Northwestern to, to build out this design uh, technology uh, in the late 1980s. Uh, and Charlie really had a major role uh, in really embodying uh, this design methodology and making it real. Uh, his entrepreneurial interest and experience uh, was pivotal to founding Questech in the late uh, 1990s and ultimately uh, moving this technology to, to major uh, U.S. Uh, corporations as, uh, since. Uh, the uh, Landing gear he's uh, standing in front of here actually use components of the Ferry MS-53 stainless steel that he designed uh, when he was at uh, Questec. And that steel uh, is a, a very significant historical milestone uh, in this uh, technology that it was uh, in 2010 uh, that the first flight of landing gear constructed of the stainless steel occurred. Uh, this is not only the first uh, stainless steel to meet the mechanical performance requirements of landing gear and allow the elimination of toxic cadmium plating, but much more significantly, this is the first fully computationally designed and qualified material to go all the way uh, to flight. Uh, and this then really uh, measures a level of maturity of this technology uh, already a, a decade ago. And that maturity uh, is also reinforced by, by this uh, timeline. Uh, it's uh, the uh, decade of the materials genome initiative so far uh, has clearly uh, demonstrated that the genome we have for materials is the CALFAD uh, fundamental data system, uh, whose origins can be traced back to Kaufman and Cohen in, in the 1950s. Uh, it was the evolution of that software in, into uh, commercial software with the introduction of Thermocalc uh, that inspired our founding uh, in 1985 of our steel research group uh, to build out an approach to computational materials design uh, that was specifically structured to use the predictive power of the CALFAD uh, fundamental data. Uh, and that led uh, to a number of demonstration projects of uh, steels uh, that ultimately led to the founding of Questec in the late uh, 1990s. Uh, but in parallel with that, uh, at the university, uh, we did uh, a number of demonstration projects of the generality of this approach, applying it uh, to other alloy systems, polymers, uh, ceramics, and even some composite uh, systems. So it really demonstrated a, a, a broad capability across all classes of, of materials. Uh, but we started with steel, uh, acknowledging that uh, it's still true today that steel is the materials uh, material class that we studied the, uh, the longest and the deepest and generated the highest quality of fundamental data. So it is the most designable uh, material system. So it's the right place to start to demonstrate the technology uh, but the fundamentals that we've established uh, in, in metals and steels in particular really are generalizable fundamentals and they can be applied across all classes of materials. It was the successes uh, in the 90s that really made the case uh, for the founding of the DARPA AIM program on accelerated insertion of materials um, in 2001. And that was really the start of what we now call ICME or Integrated Computational Materials Engineering, where the concept here was to go beyond the initial design of a new material and a specification for its composition and processing conditions uh, to address the full materials development cycle in terms of uh, process uh, optimization, scale up, uh, and the generation of the data for specifying minimum uh, properties uh, for materials uh, users. Uh, and that really uh, addressed the goals of, of the Materials Genome Initiative to look at the full cycle uh, and build out the full tool set uh, that can compress uh, that cycle. Uh, where we stand uh, today is we've now got uh, over 60 years uh, of a, uh, a Materials Genome Foundation, uh, over 30 years of a design practice, and now uh, 20 years 
uh, of uh, a fully integrated uh, technology. Uh, so it's, uh, it's, it's really here now. <laughs> Uh, the approach we take uh, builds on a systems approach to materials. Our idea is uh, rather than reinventing systems engineering, taking the well-established framework that's out there in all other branches of engineering. So each of our uh, projects starts with this type of a system chart where we can map our ultimate uh, performance goals uh, back to a set of quantitative property objectives. Uh, that are controlled by uh, microstructural uh, subsystems that uh, each dynamically evolve throughout the stages of materials processing. And with this, we can identify and prioritize the structure property and process structure uh, relations for which we want to build uh, predictive models. And in particular, uh, use our mechanistic understanding uh, to pose those relationships in terms of the fundamental parameters that are accessible from the CalFET uh, databases. Now, there's always the opportunity uh, to use uh, superficial empirical correlations, uh, but from the start, uh, our idea was to use maximum use of knowledge of me mechanism uh, to be far more in predictive than, than could be enabled by uh, empirical in, interpolation. And that really has, has paid off uh, in, in the design capability that's come out of this. The uh, tools we ultimately brought together are summarized here where uh, uh, we brought in uh, DFT uh, uh, physics to actually predict thermodynamic properties, which are particularly valuable for surface thermodynamics, which is difficult to measure. Uh, where the material science tools have been uh, most predictive and quantitative is the uh, nanoscale precipitation and the corresponding strengthening. Uh, for other mechanical properties, it's uh, tools of micromechanics that have allowed us to simulate unit processes of fracture and fatigue to get quantitative control of that as well. Uh, so it's really a combination of uh, DFT physics, material science, uh, and uh, uh, continuum mechanics that were integrated together uh, for uh, the uh, performance driven uh, design. But equally important to performance is processability, particularly as a function of scale. Uh, and that's where the material science models of the solid solid and liquid solid phase transformations are equally important in, in delivering a processable uh, material. Uh, so those are the tools that we found that we could engineer with. Um, the, uh, an example of this parameterization for CalFAT accessibility is the strength model summarized here. So in this derivation, we start with the Orawan strengthening equation and then use the uh, initial critical nucleus size as the fundamental scaling factor for particle size. Uh, and then that leads to the prediction that uh, the Orawan strengthening uh, will scale with the driving force for, predict, uh, for uh, precipitation. And so uh, this motivated a series of experimental model alloys that uh, validated and calibrated this relationship. And this really became a primary design tool uh, in the design of high performance secondary hardening uh, steels uh, that allowed us to achieve much higher uh, strengthening efficiency than in previous designs. Uh, the type of design integration we've undertaken is a graphical parametric design. Uh, these are actually contour plots related to the design of the S53 stainless landing gear steel. Uh, so this is summarizing on the left, <clears throat> a couple composition variables, uh, uh, overlaying contours of that driving force affecting the uh, strengthening efficiency uh, and overlaying uh, processability constraints of transformation temperatures and solution temperatures. So uh, meeting the uh, microstructure requirements under acceptable processing uh, conditions. Uh, the, the second plot on the right is stepping back to earlier stages of processing and optimizing the grain refining dispersions uh, in, in the steel uh, constrained by process uh, temperatures. Uh, to achieve the fine dispersions of the grain refiners that would maintain a desired uh, grain size uh, during heat treatment. So in a similar way, uh, we can step back even further and fine tune uh, the uh, deoxidation practices and, and primary inclusions uh, uh, in, in, uh, in uh, production. So typically 
Uh, we start with the end of processing and the finest scale of microstructure meeting those requirements uh, and then back up into each earlier stage uh, to fine uh, tune the, the trace additions uh, in, in uh, the, the final optimized design of a complete uh, alloy. But uh, essentially, uh, over time, we've built out the capability that the entire material can be calculated uh, up front. Um, ultimately, uh, there are limitations, of course, to the accuracy of the CalFed databases, but we find we have enough accuracy today that typically the very first iteration of design, when we prototype it, we can get within 90% of, of all the requirements we're trying to meet. Uh, and then uh, using the information from that first prototype to dial back some uh, calibration uh, corrections uh, within three iterations of design, uh, we can get uh, where, where we're trying to go. Uh, we have had examples where we've had enough accuracy that we've even gotten it right on the first uh, iteration. So it is a, a very efficient uh, process and these calculations uh, can be form, performed on a laptop. First uh, commercial products are these uh, four uh, steels uh, commercialized by Questec. Uh, we now have two flight qualified uh, aircraft landing gear steels uh, and two uh, types of very high performance uh, uh, gear steels doing very well in, in racing applications on their way to helicopter applications. Uh, all of these designs uh, involve that uh, driving force base uh, strength model that leads to an optimization of the uh, strengthening M2C carbides at a three nanometer uh, size scale <clears throat> for very efficient strengthening. And that extreme efficiency of strengthening is what's allowed us to better manage the trade-off with other properties such as fracture toughness uh, and corrosion resistance. So that each of these steels is really a uh, best in class in, in the performance uh, that, that they deliver. So those are the first commercial projects, uh, uh, products. Uh, this is uh, our track record on, on the timeline of development uh, where the scale on the left is the technology readiness levels uh, uh, for the application, while on the right are the milestones for materials development. So these two landing gear steels uh, both made it uh, under a decade, which was uh, one of the goals of, of the materials genome uh, initiative. But the second landing gear steel uh, has served as a, a case study for the materials genome initiative. And in that study, uh, it was assessed uh, as to what were the technology accelerators that we demonstrated and what were the inhibitors in doing this in a small business environment. Uh, and. Uh, it was assessed uh, that uh, the technology that was demonstrated would be capable uh, if we had continuous funding throughout these projects uh, of delivering a three-year uh, materials development cycle. And that's a very important benchmark because that gets the materials cycle down to the scale of product development for the first time. And historically, concurrent engineering has meant everything except materials it now allows materials uh, to be part of concurrent engineering. And that's a very, a very new world. And a uh, very historic example was the four new alloys that Apple announced with the release of the Apple Watch in 2014. Uh, these are all uh, you know, significantly novel alloy uh, designs. Uh, they were each delivered, uh, uh, developed concurrently uh, with the design of these devices and delivered in less than two years from uh, acquiring the technology uh, that enabled it. And the anodizable 7,000 uh, aluminum uh, made its way into subsequent iPhones and other products too. Uh, so in these applications, uh, this technology has, very, has had very broad impact in, in consumer products. But the uh, news travels fast to the valley and all of this caught the attention of this man. And I do like to point out that he likes to be photographed in front of stainless steel. Uh, so it uh, became public uh, about five years ago that uh, Charlie Cuman uh, left Apple after three years there uh, to join Mr. Musk as uh, the vice president for materials engineering at both SpaceX uh, and Tesla. And that has led to some very exciting uh, interactions, most of which we're not allowed to talk about. Uh, with the notable exception when Mr. Musk himself puts out a tweet. So this is a great example and a very rare example of an American corporate CEO bragging about his metallurgist. So this was acknowledging 
the uh, very novel design of a burn-resistant nickel-based superalloy that was actually vitally important to the concept of the Raptor engine that uh, enables the, the Mars uh, Starship, uh, the, the efficiency that's needed for that. Uh, and uh, so in, in fact, th this actual design uh, was initially done uh, at, at Cuesta. Um, but uh, the other aspect of this uh, that uh, Charlie cuman has been allowed to talk about in some of his public uh, lectures is this was part of a tremendous acceleration of the whole concurrent engineering uh, process as represented by transforming this classical V structure to this vertical structure here. So every level of the subsystems uh, in, in this Raptor engine uh, was addressed concurrently, uh, including uh, the uh, final development of a ra rather nascent uh, designed uh, super alloy that was central to the whole concept uh, of the engine. Uh, so it was great to see that the accelerated materials technology was a, was a key piece uh, to this high level of uh, concurrency. Uh, so things are happening at, at a fantastic uh, pace uh, at, uh, at uh, SpaceX with, with this technology. Uh, the other thing that's going on is before Charlie showed up, uh, Mr. Musk was enamored of the uh, fashionable materials such as uh, carbon fiber uh, composites, uh, including early on making some uh, liquid oxygen tanks out, out of CFRP, uh, leading to some, some of those early famous uh, rocket explosions. Uh, along the way, they actually uh, demonstrated a scale up of a CFRP liquid oxygen tank at the scale they would need for the Mars uh, Starship, which of course could give a far more spectacular explosion than the ones that have been demonstrated. Uh, but with uh, Charlie showing up and introducing some rationality to their approach to materials engineering, uh, this led to Mr. Musk actually writing an article himself that appeared in Popular Mechanics. And he explained the limitations of CFRP compared to the much, uh, uh, much broader temperature capability of uh, cold rolled stainless steel and its extreme manufacturability. So there's been a real sea change in the materials technology at SpaceX, uh, virtually eliminating CFRP and displacing it with uh, much more efficient designs of, of, uh, of steels. So I'm sure uh, Charlie, we've, uh, that's, I'm sure that Harry is very pleased uh, with this example. Uh, meanwhile, uh, over at Tesla, it's been a really exciting uh, innovation in automotive uh, structure technology. Uh, this may be one of the greatest breakthroughs in automotive uh, structure technology. It was the concept of gigacasting. So it was Mr. Musk's vision that the uh, uh, die casting would be scaled up so that he could make the aluminum structures he wanted for the necessary uh, light weighting uh, to get enough range out of a fully electric vehicle uh, to make the aluminum structure uh, scale up die casting to make it out of two parts. Uh, so th this was uh, really a colossal achievement. And you know, the very first step had to be the design of that very novel uh, alloy. And it was CalFAD based design uh, based on the eutectic phase fractions uh, optimization uh, to achieve uh, the properties uh, uh, desired strength and ductility in the ASCAST uh, state. Uh, so uh, Charlie has been, uh, it, it, this was all delivered in about a two year cycle, of not only the, uh, the alloy, but uh, Charlie was flying all around the world, uh, even during this pandemic, setting up plants in uh, China and Germany, uh, scaling up uh, this casting technology and it is in production today. So again, it, it, uh, extremely novel innovation in materials and materials processing uh, de delivered at, a, at a, a, a lightning pace. But uh, with, with these achievements, uh, this has convinced uh, Mr. Musk even more of the power of computational materials design. He's a strong enough believer that it was recently announced in the past year that in addition to Charlie having these two materials groups at the two companies, at Tesla specifically, they have now created a materials applications team, uh, essentially training the materials user engineers to understand that materials are designable uh, at the pace that they need. And Mr. Musk wants all the legacy alloys they use to be completely changed 
uh, to custom alloys they designed to take every one of these systems to a higher level of optimization. So it, it, it's great to hear. And uh, at this point, I, I think it's Elon Musk is the, probably the most influential champion of ICMB uh, technology. Great to have him on board. Meanwhile, uh, there's been uh, a uh, recent National Academy study, a uh, decadal review of materials research in 2019, and there were two uh, very important recommendations to come out of it. Number one, uh, restoring research in the so-called classical materials of metals and ceramics. And so as, uh, as we rediscover the importance of bringing back domestic manufacturing it makes metals very important again. So uh, it's recognized that for several decades, we've had taken on tremendous damage and loss of capability in metals and ceramics, and it's time to bring it back. Uh, the other important recommendation is they have uh, proposed that this materials genome initiative should con uh, continue uh, for another uh, decade. So it's, it's great to see that this is all uh, moving forward. And so finally, uh, the uh, assuming that someday this dreadful pandemic will actually be over uh, is our plan in 2023 to host uh, the International Califad Conference at MIT. And I hope you'll join us there uh, and we can all celebrate uh, the achievements of this new technology that Harry has uh, so significantly helped us to, to bring about. I thank you for your attention and I thank Harry. Thank you very much, Professor Olson, for the brilliant talk. And it's very interesting to, to know that Tesla is uh, really paving forward for the material development as well. Um, is there any question from the audience or comments? Can I ask a question, Yante? Of course. Yes, you may, Her. You may ask a question. <laughs> Thank you. So, Greg. Um, Obviously, you need a person in industry who has vision beyond the normal and access to huge quantities of money. So, for example, Charlie's, Charlie's die-cast alloy, you know, yeah. set up a factory for $100 million yep. uh, within the two-year period and then handed over the factory. And I think that is the bit that is exceptional in the U.S., as opposed to say in Europe and so on, is that people, there aren't these individual leaders who have the vision to take things forward. So the stainless steel rocket, for example, yep. you know, even the people working in steels don't know about that story. Right. <laughs> yes. I think you need to push uh, Charlie Cuman to send me some photographs because I emailed him Oh, really? He hasn't responded. So if you can do that, I can put it all in my book. <laughs> okay. Well, okay. you've got my you got my slide now. Anyway, I <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's a fantastic story, and I, I would like to see uh, uh, it written up. So, in fact, this is something uh, I'm on uh, uh, from the perspective of the ACTA journals. We, we would like to see Charlie and Elon Musk put something together and, and write down what's going on in this technology because they're so far ahead of the rest of the world. It's absolutely astounding. So, yeah. so we recently elected uh, Elon Musk as a fellow of the Royal Society. Very good. Yep. He's an amazing guy. Mm -hmm. he really is. But that it's it's so rare though in an American corporation to have technical leadership, right? So the engineer is running the company. You know, we've had too many companies uh, run run by accountants and lawyers, and uh, all they do is step on the brake pedal. Uh, but uh, the, the 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 vision that that he has, and and the ability of uh, of Charlie to deliver on this vision, you know, make it actually happen, is, is really great to see. Yeah. So if, if no one has a question, then um, what's happening about Elon Musk's boring company? Well, I know, you know, he's, uh, he's still trying to make things happen and, and, and set up transports in different locations. I, I haven't heard the latest on where that goes, but I, I know they uh, ultimately, uh, they're going to send it to Mars. 
uh, you know, there will be a, a subterranean civilization on Mars, uh, Mars, where that boring technology will actually have an important role once it's sent up there. Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting that, you know, a, a lot of it's, uh, I, I think why it's so exciting uh, to work at Musk's uh, companies is just that the, the, the goals of the companies are so elevating, you know, uh, to, to really, to, to, to make humans an interplanetary species, right? You know, we were gonna, <laughs> we're gonna set up on Mars. Uh, and, and the electrification of transportation, you know, it was just a notion, he, he made it real and now it's just absolutely taking off, you know? Yeah. and driving all kinds of infrastructure to, to support it, you know, but wow, it's great to see. So is there a Lotus uh, which is electric? Actually, the very first uh, Tesla was a Lotus Elise. Okay. Yeah, and, and that's the one that, that he uh, sent into space, which is why I have this picture behind <laughs> So for those of you who don't know, Greg has a, he's a big fan of Lotus. Absolutely. And uh, the Lotus Elise is the, uh, the one that he has now. His daughter's name is Elise. That's right, which is why I, I was uh, able to convince my wife that it was a sign from God. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and Jane sends her very best uh, regards, Harry. Thank you, thank you. So Yanpei, if nobody has uh, questions, uh, yeah. I'd just like to say that, you know, both Francisca and Greg gave superb talks today. Uh, yeah. And of course it's because they've done a huge amount of work. And I was very worried about Greg actually, because I thought he would start with his systems chart, which he always does, but it came in the middle of the talk, so that's okay. Yeah, and, and you complained about my stuff about Cyril Smith, so I left it out this time. Okay. <laughs> Thank you both. Hey, I, I just got word this week. I, I've actually won the TMS uh, Smith Award in honor of my work. C.S. Yeah, Smith, right? Yes, yes. Oh, right. Congratulations. Congratulations. Yes. Very, very, very pleased to have that one. That's very special mm -hmm. significance to me. <laughs> yeah. Congratulations. Thank you. Is there anybody also wants to make some comments? Huh? or discussions? I guess I explained it all too well then. I think both of you did, you know. Yeah, uh, we see a lot of interaction uh, on the chat uh, with mm -hmm. Francesca on different questions as well. Uh, there is one raised hand from uh, Fabio Miani. Can, can you hear me? Yes. yes, we can hear you. I don't think you can see me, but I am there somewhere. Okay. Uh, we can. Yeah, so, also. Professor, <laughs> Professor Greg, thank you for your presentation. Also, also to, to Francisca Cavalier as well. Uh, my question is about, uh, you know, uh, developing uh, uh, CALFAD methodology with the students. My impression is that uh, either they are skilled in using uh, CALFAD methods either they are skilled in experimental uh, techniques or uh, let's say, generally speaking, mechanical engineering, but finding them interested in both is very difficult. This is my opinion, especially because normally, uh, I hope that Thermocal wouldn't uh, say I'm too, too, too bad with them. It's rather expensive. So if you want to get the full picture, you should have a, a very good funded uh, university. Otherwise it would be difficult to use uh, uh, op open software. There are some uh, steps, uh, but the young guys, uh, like the guys running peak alpha, the, they are very, very good with uh, software. But I, I, my impression is that uh, they are a little bit far from, from uh, applications in material science uh, uh, and in metallurgy. What is your opinion? So. Is it possible in the future to, to, for, to, to, to have uh, students 
that will be then the engineers, uh, the, the, the professors, the researchers, a little bit well, closer. I, I, to I think we, we, we do have the problem okay. unique to materials that compared to all the other engineering disciplines that have been teaching design, historically, we never taught design and materials. So we, we've largely trained experimentalists. Uh, which is a very different mentality uh, from design, which is to conceive something new from your knowledge and then uh, imp implement it. That's a very different culture and it's taking a long time to bring that culture to the materials uh, community. Uh, that's really what's pacing the, evo the evolution. Uh, as far as the uh, affordability of, of you know, commercial CalFed tools, uh, I think with initiatives like the Materials Genome Initiative, uh, this, there is now research funding for people to develop this technology and license the tools uh, that enable it. So I think it, it will be pop possible now for a prolif proliferation of these tools within the academic uh, uh, system through the research activities. And that'll create a much better uh, educational environment to actually practice CalFAD-based design of materials. Thank you. There is an, also another raised hand from Professor Dong. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, right. Uh, thanks for sharing the story about this uh, Tesla's ca uh, mega casting application. That's very uh, exciting, wonderful things. Um, normally, mega casting has a low profile. You know, uh, looking to uh, 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 these applications. I wonder this could kind of a story could be uh, adopted or could be used in for other application or other sectors for this we said this fundamental or, or, or manufacturing routes. And then we need probably need also clever ideas and then to, to, to generate this kind of uh, uh, big societal impact. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. But, but again, you know, it comes back to, you know, rebuilding uh, manufacturing. These now become the issues that are really important. And this is what moves manufacturing forward. And it all, uh, it, uh, most of it centers around metals right now. Mm. Yeah, normally a metal casting, uh, we say it's very, very low profile. And then, uh, Start from sand casting or die casting or, or press, and then right. we see this technology has been improving, but we just have probably has been looked down <laughs> because a lot very uh, a posh area to 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 work, and also this proper kind of profile sense, and then this manufacturing research we probably need to increase our profile and by machine. Yep. This well, I, I think the concept of giga casting certainly helps that uh, profile. Mm. Yeah. Mm. And, and of course, what this is now going to drive is uh, evolution mm. of the, the dye technology to better support this and mm. uh, get better heat transfer and reduce the cycle times at this kind of scale. Mm. Mm. I also hope you know, look into this kind of uh, very high pressure dye casting, probably not only uh, to reduce the, the costs and also could improve the overall the structure integrity. Uh, I have not done this, uh, any research on this, so I'm just suspecting uh, this could be one of another benefit to look into it. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Then, yeah, yeah, we remove lots of joints and then uh, this could be, uh, could be uh, uh, another way to look into it, not only cost saving, but also performance improvement. Sure. Yeah. And uh, you certainly don't want to sacrifice performance as you reduce cost. But uh, uh, in this case, uh, they've done it. You know, they, they really met their performance goals and, and, uh, and, and tremendously reduced the cost of building those aluminum structures. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then uh, this is something which Harry has done well to this sector, a uh, steel sector. We're ready to pro pro promote ourselves. <laughs> Telling yes, yes. <laughs> right. Well, that, that's why I brought up that National Academy report. I, I think it's, mm. it's, it's about time we had such a report that explained we need to get back to metals again, right? Mm. Uh, I hope it'll have some impact. And certainly uh, this whole materials genome initiative is being led by uh, physical metallurgy, no question about it. Mm. And, uh, you know, other uh, 
uh, experts and other classes and materials are looking to the example of physical metallurgy and, and looking how can they adapt the same approach to their material. Mm. So it's really, it's really brought metallurgy back to a, a leadership position at the, mm. at the intellectual frontier of the technology. Mm. And also recently we're doing a, something like theater drilling approach and looking at manufacturing processes. Uh, also look into uh, materials databases. Uh, oh yeah, I, I, yeah, I meant to comment, you know, all that work that Harry did on uh, those ugly multi-pass welds, you know, uh, mm -hmm. now, now it's the core technology of additive manufacturing scaled down. Yeah. <laughs> As now turn, take on, on new importance and mm -hmm. a completely new manufacturing technology. Mm -hmm. And then after a few months time, and then we not get back to, we talk to the industry, we present what we have done so far. And then, uh, 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 and then the question is uh, what the industry can benefit from it. And then look at the accuracy of the prediction. I said, Hong, this is not good enough. <laughs> uh, now we get back to, we said, okay, we start from physics models and then how can we use this, the data to enhance the physical uh, uh, models? This is the thing that I'm, I'm uh, actually doing. And that question I'm probably want to discuss with you, uh, Greg. It's a, uh, you know, core fed is very important to a way establish and then uh, to uh, uh, could uh, this kind of data driven be uh, used to enhance this kind of searching new materials. Uh, uh, well, actually, what what I've been advocating for the next decade of the materials genome initiative, you know, having demonstrated what CalFed can do. Uh, you know, in the human genome initiative, they set out to measure 3 billion base pairs in uh, over 13 years. They started out with something impossible, hmm. uh, and they got it down to an average cost of $1 per base pair. Uh, in the structure of CalFed, the equivalent of a base pair is a tie line. It's really those uh, equilibrium tie lines that drive the most accurate thermodynamic assessments. And so how do we build out the technology of the $1 tie line? Uh, what, what are the high throughput techniques uh, that we could assemble so that we make it very affordable to rapidly expand CalFed? Uh, and that will have tremendous impact if we do that. So, you know, Professor Fabio Mianis uh, uh, asked a question earlier, but uh, he is very keen on the new open CalFed um, mm -hmm process which uh, Bo Sunman is uh, creating, yep. you know, where the software itself right. is yep. open source and yes. the data, you can build your own data sets from either published data yep. or uh, buy a data set. Yeah, and I, I, you know, we're looking at this, uh, you know, rapid tie line uh, measurement thing as, as what would be the open data, you know, it, it's the, it's the, uh, it's the pre-CalFed proto data that supports a CalFed assessment, but then we're free to approach how we do those assessments. And that's, that's where there can be some competition on somebody building a better database from the same data. Okay, I, I want to thank again to our two speakers today, really wonderful talks. And also I want to thank all the audience for participating today. We hope to see you again at the same time in this forum next Tuesday. Um, until then, please take care and I right. hope you enjoy the rest of your week. Thank you, Yanpei. Thank, Thank you very you. much, everyone. Take care. Thank you, Harry. Yeah. Mm. Take care.